Thank you for downloading this podcast from the Forum for Philosophy. Subscribe for weekly discussions of science, culture, politics and the arts from a philosophical perspective. The Forum is a non-profit organisation and our events are free and open to all. You can support our work via our website and Facebook page. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Forum. I'm Sarah Fine from King's College London and fellow here at the Forum, and we're really excited about tonight's event, which is on protest art. So we're going to be asking, what exactly is protest art, and in what sense is it art? Can something be protest art if it becomes critically and commercially successful? Why, if at all, is art a good medium for protest? And is it possible to balance the objectives of making art and doing something political? And I'm delighted to introduce our brilliant panel for this evening. To my right, we have Sasha Golob, who is Senior Lecturer in Philosophy and Co-Director of the Centre for Philosophy and the Visual Arts at King's College London, which is co-sponsoring tonight's event. Sasha writes about modern French and German philosophy and the philosophy of art. And to my left, we have Robert Montgomery, who describes himself as following a tradition of conceptual art and bringing a, a poetic voice to the discourse of text art. He makes billboard poems, light pieces, fire poems, woodcuts, and watercolors. And on my far left, we have Stephanie Schwartz, who's a lecturer in American Modernism at University College London. She writes about documentary film and photography in the US and about photography and performance in Cuba. So thank you very much for coming and welcome to you all. I'm going to go straight in with our first question to the panel, and that is what exactly is protest art? Stephanie, if you could kick us off. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, well, <clears throat> of course, you know, a very difficult question to answer in uh, simple terms, but I thought I would start with thinking very, car like thinking a bit about what that term, how that term comes to be and the kind of historical resonances of that term, because I feel like one of the things worth thinking about and engaging with the question of protest art is to think about how those words, art and protest, have shifted so drastically and how even if people use those terms today. But so I wanted to kind of think about it historically and which is what I kind of do in my work as well. But I thought what I would start with would be a kind of simple recognizable example, which is the work that you use to advertise today's event, which is the Guernica, which we see kind of projected behind us a bit. Um, but I was interested not just in thinking about Guernica and Picasso's, if we think about that as a kind of protest in paint, if we can think about that that way, but also the way in which that image of Guernica circulated and became a kind of site of protest throughout the 60s and 70s as well. And thinking in particular of one famous example that I has always gets kind of brought up in, ther in terms of thinking about how we historicize something called protest art or kind of think about what are these kind of canonical moments that we can kind of latch on to to define this term. Um, and one famous example of that is an event that took place at the Museum of Modern Art in 1970 when the Art Workers Coalition decided to stage a protest in front of the Guernica painting. Um, and one of the things that I'm really interested in thinking about this term of what is protest art is um, kind of thinking about the relationship between an actual political protest and what happens when it, when that thing becomes art or what is the art within that kind of protest activity. And so this was a famous protest in which obviously it was a, well, not obviously, but it was a protest in relation to thinking about the war in Vietnam, but specifically in relation to the museum's relationship to that war. So many times when we think about protest in relation to artistic practice, we think about it in relation to the institution of the museum as well. And I think that's something worth thinking about. Um, and what those group of artists did was to stand in front of Picasso's Guernica, which was housed at the museum, and pass out what has become a very kind of famous and kind of canonical poster called End Babies, which some of you might be familiar with, which was a poster that was taken, that was made of a photograph um, by one of an army photographer who had been to Vietnam of the My Lai Massacre. And they took that photograph and then they overlaid 
quotes from an interview um, about the killings and one of Mike Wallace, who was the famous interviewer, had said, and babies. And then they passed that out in front of the, um, at the museum in front of the work as a kind of protest of the war, as a protest of the museum's engagement or inability to acknowledge its relationship to the war, but also I think in relation to kind of a general image culture about the war, um, because those photographs had already been circulating in Life magazine in 1969. And so one of the things I'm really interested in thinking about in relation to these kinds of questions is that kind of circulation of images and what happens when something I mean, my interest is specifically in relation to film and photography. Um, and so what happens when those c images circulate and how then they produce certain kinds of publics because those images like Picasso's Guernica or like the photographs in Life magazine become, are known because they're circulating in kind of mass media um, activities. So that's one way in which I think that we could begin to think about kind of this question of, you know, what, what is protest art and this kind of slippage between something that's protest and something that's a kind of artistic work as well. Mm. So I don't know if that's, that's my initial kind of opening gambit. No, that's fantastic as a starting point. And Robert, do you want to follow up with your interpretation of protest art? Um, yeah, I can. Actually, can we go to a slide on page three of the, of the PDF that we have behind the thing? Sorry. Because it's sort of follow-ons from... Follows on from Stephanie, I think. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Oh, too long, please. Sorry. Here you go. Um, this example is um, a sort of, I don't know what it does in relation to that mm -mm. artwork being a site of protest in the museum, <laughs> but it's a sort of, it's maybe a conversation along the same sort of lines between a work that I made in 2012 and Occupy London, which were, which was a sort of dialogue, and this was a billboard I did in Old Street in 2012, which was a sort of piece that was almost like a, a love poem to Occupy London, I thought of it as that, really, because I thought what they were doing was very moving, and I found their protest to be much more, perhaps, educated than the press were saying, and I thought it was a sort of really um, amazing sort of human statement really so i wrote i wrote um there are wooden houses on land in faraway places that don't cost much money and strings of lights that make paths to them gently and do not turn off the stars and a hundred black flags of anarchists held up at night a hundred miles apart ten thousand miles of flags and a little row of tents in front of the cathedral guard our future there will be a quick sickness the kind that kills the body before the mind knows, and then there will be a slow rising. And I got a letter from Occupy London asking if I could, they could repurpose a phrase um, from that piece into their banner when they occupied the London Stock Exchange. And so on the next slide you have, they actually paraphrased it from a, a row of tents to a line of tents, and you see their banner there sort of echoing the <coughs> white on black font I had as they carried it around on the Occupy Stock Exchange day. And that for me was the sort of de facto answer to a question I had, which was could you engage with current political discourse by making art? And it was a positive answer because they got in touch and it was a, became a really interesting dialogue. And I worked with them over the next four or five months on various things and it was quite validating in terms of um, making art seem real in the world for me. Yeah, but it, it, if, sorry, can I jump back in? Yeah, of course. It, I mean, in terms of what I was talking about, I think it's, it resonates really nicely because of the way in which these, whether it's an image or a line of text or a linguistic prompt, it's about a recirculation of something that was in public in one place and then trans is, is moves to another public space or another site become something else, but there's still that kind of relationship to its first iteration. And then you build an audience around those kinds of relationships, yeah, almost, which I think is important. <coughs> which almost about. builds rhetoric around it in a sense. Yeah, which is, I think, what's one of the things that's interesting for me to think about in terms of these questions about um, the relationship between art and protest in terms of, yeah, thinking about the circulation of images and producing a public that, that knows those images and then sees them in different formats and um, can relate to them in, the, in those kinds of different ways. Brilliant. Sasha, do you want to come in here? 
bring the kind of philosophical dimension. To yeah, no, no, no. I mean, thank you, Sarah. I mean, that, that yeah. was that was fascinating stuff. I mean, I think I think the first thing we need to do is separate it off from kind of related activity. So it, protest art is not the same as protest by artists, it seems to me. It seems you can be an artist, you can go on a protest march. That's not automatically protest art. It's not the same as political engagement by artists. Um, you know, a case that I, I think is very dear to a lot of our hearts is uh, Boys, and, you know, Boys was a Green Party candidate for the European Parliament, but that act itself was not an act of protest art, I don't think. Similarly, when Assemble won the Turner Prize, that, I think, wasn't an act of protest art, the, the work they were producing there, although it was deeply politically engaged. I also don't think that being deeply politically engaged um, generally is going to be enough to make something protest art. I mean, War and Peace is not an example of protest art. So I think it's a, quite a distinctive uh, media, and it seems to me that it's defined by the use of canonical or recognizably artistic forms to intervene in politics in a way that refuses dialogue. Uh, and it's partly because of this refusal of dialogue that I think that something like War and Peace is not, not a good example. And it's also because of this refusal of dialogue that I think the, the classic form of protest art in the 20th century is the kind of collage. It's sort of fractured words that disorientate or reorientate the viewer, but where there's, there's not a, a sort of classical possibility of a kind of exchange of political arguments. I think also in the 20th century it's particularly tied up with the form of the spectacle, um, with the sort of instantly visually arresting um, image, uh, and again here you see the overlap with collage, and in, I mean in that sense a lot of protest art, particularly in the West since I guess the 60s, is in many ways advertising's kind of dark twin. It's the use of advertising techniques, use of advertising uh, linguistic techniques, refracted into a disorientating, um, disturbing intervention into the political sphere that aim is to rejig things without engaging in a kind of dialectic um, exchange of reasons or defensive reasons. I think that's, that's a really great provocation for Robert there. So on, on the one hand, you mentioned uh, the refusal of dialogue, and yet your presentation of your interaction with Occupy was as a kind of dialogue with your work. And then the second point was about the use of advertising techniques, but the mm. sort of subversion of them. And of course, your use of billboards is a version of that. Yeah. Um, well, I like the idea of being advertising as dark twin. <laughs> but I think um, that's an interesting point. I, I don't think all protest art um, suffocates dialogue or, or, or doesn't, doesn't facilitate dialogue, actually. Maybe not very good, sort of shocking protest art does. Um, I mean, in my own work, I've, I've tried to sort of almost change the work I've been making in public space into dialogue projects. Right. Um, and it's partly for that reason that I didn't want to just be sort of seen as being a bombastic protester about something and, and, you know, um, actually that what I've got, Nick's in these few slides, I think, does Ah, has the peace poem, which, which, and this is why I went in this direction exactly because of what you said, Sasha. I thought, you know, a sort of Dada's collage of the horrors of, of 20th century society makes us feel bad, but doesn't really do anything to help, right? Um, this is a project that I've been doing this year, and it's in, today it's in, today it's in Coventry, um, as part of the centenary of, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, and it is uh, it's called the Peace Point. It's called Paper Peace, and it's a piece that travels Britain from November twelfth, being the f hundred years from the first day of peace after the end of World War One, and it goes around. It's been ordered to Dewsbury, Stoke on Trent, Nottingham, Peterborough, Slough, uh, and now Coventry today. Um, the point of the the work is not the work itself. My text piece is the beginning of the work. It travels, and in those five cities or towns it's been to already, there's sets of young producers who get funding from the Arts Council to commission their own artworks, um, and also funding from Heritage Lottery to build a national peace archive, which is something we don't have. So an archive essentially of peace heroes, um, not to denigrate war heroes, but to give an alternative history to that question. Um, so by the end of the project in November next year, we'll 
cu curate, cu curate by the young producers five new artworks, not by me, but by whoever they choose. And then a national peace archive that will be held at the Bradford Peace Museum and accessible nationally. So exactly a dialogue then um, in which my voice becomes a very small voice by the end. And, and, and it's a piece in collective voice by the end. Do you want to come back? On yeah, no, I mean, just, just to say, I mean, I, I suppose two things. I mean, firstly, I definitely don't think the refusal of dialogue is always a negative thing. Um, I mean, I think one of the interesting things about the 20th century political situation, 20th century literature, is the valorization of a certain kind of refusal to speak or a refusal to engage in conversation at certain points. Um, and also, I think we can see how slippery this term protest art is. Yeah. So, you know, when you have a kind of... Um, ongoing co-creation with the audience in which um, there's a, a sort of polyphony of voices coming in to build up a gradual picture that may ultimately lead it to say a political position distinct from where it started with. Yeah. Is that still protest art? And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I mean, I, I don't see any kind of point in, I wouldn't worry too much about policing the terms. I think well, that, that's a very interesting I mean, thing in itself. The, in the mechanics of this project, there's something very important to me also, which was trying to get the idea of a peace archive in under the radar of, of official staff. Right. So to get a peace archive funded by heritage lottery funding, for example, gave it a legitimacy that, you know, just, just us going on a stop the war march, and I was very involved with stop the war, wasn't really giving us. But to, to try yeah. to get things into official history seems important in terms of recognizing the peace movement from a World War One conscious objectors through Green and Common through stop the war. So, getting it some sort of official recognition was for me a big part of the protest in a sense or I, and I don't think of myself as a protest artist at all but just as an artist who cares about things hmm. okay really fascinating so at this point I want to open up to you the audience here and see if anybody has any questions I should say we're live streaming the event and recording it for a podcast so there's a roving microphone and please do wait for that to arrive with you before starting your question so do we have any questions about the opening gambit what is protest art hello well I can't say it's been made any clearer by these opening gambits because <laughs> we've had a, a rather strange philosophical uh, position taken out of nowhere seemingly not justified that it, protest art involves a refusal of dialogue I don't know where that comes from we didn't explain it and yet there's a guy who's been engaged in dialogue and presumably if his work's relevant then he, either that's a contradiction to your thesis or maybe his stuff isn't art I don't know what what you make of that but you've just I don't understand what you've just done. That's amazing, really. It seems it's a standing contradiction to your thesis straight away. Or you, maybe you're going to attack it and say it's not really art or he's not really protesting, but surely he was involved in a, <coughs> a classic case of protest in the case of the Occupy movement, and he's written something that was provoking a, a, a dialogue. And so I'd, what use is that, that this um, claim of yours? Okay, thank you very much. That's great. So, Sasha, could you say a little bit more about what you mean by refusal of dialogue in this context? Yeah, sure, of course. I mean, I think, I think the interesting thing is, is Robert, the last line of Robert's remarks where he said, I don't think of myself as a protest artist. I think of myself as an artist who cares about things. Um, so in that sense, what he's doing isn't necessarily in contradiction with what I'm saying because he doesn't necessarily see what he's doing as protest art. He sees himself as an artist who's engaged in a range of political activities. And it seems to me that the dialogic structure of the uh, peace project is that protest art or not what i'm suggesting is a definition on which it isn't going to be why am i doing that so that we can try and think a bit hard about what exactly protest art is rather than just classifying all vaguely political art or all deliberately political art as protest art because if we do that war and peace becomes protest art just as Guernick becomes protest art just as uh, holzer becomes protest art and the whole category gets incredibly blurred and loose and useless so i'm trying to to come up with a definition that won't, of course, fit all the cases, precisely so that we can see more clearly the cases it does fit. And so what is the refusal of dialogue exactly in this context? Dialogue with whom? What kind of dialogue? Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, I think if you look at canonical cases of protest art, I mean, think of something like um, Jenny Holtz's work here, you'll often see uh, immediately arresting slogans that make some sort of broad political point. Okay, so, 
power is going to be abused, something like that. And there's clearly a political agenda with them, okay, so you're meant to understand a particular position from them. Now, if you imagine someone who doesn't share that political position, okay, and they see this thing, are they going to feel that there's been an engagement with the reasons why they hold the other view? Are they going to feel that they've been talked round to the new view, given, given justifications for accepting the new view? No, they're probably not, because what you're getting is a sort of flash, a strike, that's not trying to give an argument for the positions it holds particularly. It's trying to provoke, it's trying to um, disturb, to redirect, to reorientate. And all of those are powerful and important things, but they're not the same, I think, as the kind of political dialogue you would have if I went over to you and said, look, you and I disagree about politics, tell me where you think what you do, and let's have, a, let's have a conversation about it, and I'll try and convince you, I'll give you some reasons for, and you'll give me some reasons, and we'll see where we go next. So I think it's distinctive because it doesn't have that kind of structure typically. Now, I definitely don't mean that this is a criticism of Robert, and if, I think if he doesn't see himself as a protest artist, in a way that, that meshes perfectly with what I'm saying, it's because he's got this dialogic structure that he isn't doing protest art, even if some of his pieces are closer or further away from that category. Do you want to come back in here, Robert? I'd lo I love the idea that political debate could create consensus that we could all agree on. Especially, no, I, mean, especially I definitely today. don't think that. But. Especially today um, in Parliament. But the, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can see the argument for Jenny Holtzer being slightly sun bitey. Um, I mean, she's in my slideshow, if you want to see, <laughs> funnily. <laughs> Every, everyone's had she's picking on I've got some way here. Um, this is Jenny Holtzer. And I had her in the slideshow as because I'm interested in what she does with context. Mm. And this is an early piece of hers from the 80s, and it says, raise boys and girls the same way. And what I thought was touching about this piece was the context, because she hired the sort of halftime scoreboard at the San Francisco baseball field and put it on in the middle of a sports game, which I thought was a great use of context. And so, you know, that's one of the tools that that she uses. And I admire her work very much and, I, and was very inspired by her work. So, um I mean, I think, I think it's, you know, the challenge for philosophers is to give def definitions to everything and, and it's not always that simple. <laughs> Maybe we'll get closer to a definition or an undefinition by the end of the, 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 the debate. Um, back to one of Sasha's earlier points from his introduction. <laughs> um, this is Joseph Boyce's poster for the Green Party in 1979 and he's also a hero of mine and he was a founder member of the Green Party in Germany in 1979, one of eight people that started the Green Party in Germany. And in my view, contrasting a bit with what Sasha said, I think Joseph Boyce sees this as part of his holistic, a holistic art practice that includes making art and being political, um, set within a sort of expanded field of what art can be. And I think that that was what he was trying to get at. So he, you know, he gave, he gave lectures on ecology. He made art about ecology. And then finally in 79, he founded the Green Party with seven other people, which is, you know, arguably a bigger legacy than any of his art. So, um, I'm interested in that idea of a sort of holistic practice where you can, you know, do your installations in a museum and found a political party in a parliament at the same time. And there shouldn't be contradictory things. And does the audience matter? for this question. So I think you've mentioned in the past that it's very important for you that ordinary people walk past your billboards and, and, and see them and experience them. So does this question of audience matter? Stephanie mentioned the protest within the museum. Who's the audience there? Does that matter? So can I put that question to you? Does, it, does the audience matter for the question of what is protest art? Who's it for? Um, well, I guess I wanted to ask well, I wanted to go back a little bit because just to the question, yeah, to follow up a bit on Robert was saying about the kind of relationship with, between art and politics, because I agree that with Sasha's point that just because you're an artist and you protest doesn't mean you're producing protest art. But at the same time, I feel like one of the things that is really opening up here is this question of we have to really rethink the category of art mm -hmm. because the idea of the way in which we defined it in even the 30s or the 60s and how people define what is artistic practice today has changed so drastically mm. um, that I feel that actually this attempt to keep kind of 
Although I, I do agree and want to separate, and I know I'm not answering your question, but the political mm -hmm. from the political, the activities that you might have as a political person from the art that you make, at the same time, I wonder if that's still possible and if it's, if, if what some artists are doing actually makes that kind of impossible in a certain kind of way. And maybe in some way that does go to the kind of audience question because it, we do, I think, more and more see the question of, if we even want to call it protest art, or whether it's just kind of activism, um, not taking place in kind of institutional context necessarily, though always reflecting back, or not always, but often reflecting back on the institutional context of the museum. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me today that some of the most kind of political ventures that we have are being made by artists. And whether those are people that actually make things that we recognize as art mm -hmm. is a is another question, um, but those activities are taking place around or outside or in the institution of a museum because of the way which I think the museum is so tied up, to go back to one of Sasha's other points, with kind of spectacle culture and the ways in which that you can't, you know, you can't kind of tease these things out in a certain kind of way. I don't know if that... Do you want to come in here, Sasha? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think I agree with all that. I think that's, um, I mean, I definitely don't want to separate uh, you know, I think it's it's absolutely right to have a notion of a holistic art practice, and clearly, it's it's not the case that you can separate, you know, what the artist does when he or she leaves the studio from the rest of the rest of what they're doing. It's just thinking about um, what's distinctive about is there anything distinctive about this category of protest art as opposed to an artist who's politically engaged more broadly, um, and maybe maybe there isn't. Um, mm. I mean, we could reverse the question. We, we could ask if we could define what status quo art is. Yeah. So, you know, anything, any art that would be seen to be tacitly um, supporting the status quo could be then seen as the opposite of protest art. And we could categorize that. We could, we could, we could, we could counter categorize protest art. I'm not sure. I think part of your responsibility as an artist is to engage with the things you care about. And, and, you know, it's very difficult. To make art at this point in history, um, when we're sitting on the verge of absolute ecological annihilation, potentially within the next five decades, and not engage in some way with with the politics of ecology, at least if not the politics of society, um, it's also very difficult to see. Um, you know, having lived through as artists and academics what we thought of as the period of postmodernism from the 70s until the early 2000s, to be living in a time when pre-modernist ideas seem to have taken hold. Um, you know, Trump could be seen as a classic pre-modernist. Um, and, and, and find ourselves sort of, that we dipped ourselves into a sort of false sense of security by reading Jean-Francois Lyotard. That, that we, we, you know, modernism had worked for a start and we got beyond it. Well, modernism hasn't even begun to work, you see. We haven't even begun to educate society to work towards what modernism could have brought us. So it's very, so we're in a state of psychological crisis because of that. And I, for one, am quite traumatized. I think. Yeah, I mean, sorry, just, I mean, you can see how complicated it all is mm. because, I mean, the, the issue of, say, whether Trump is pre modern, I mean, in some ways, Trump seems to be a uniquely post modern creature. I mean, there's, there's, um, and from the media strategy to the to the self-image to the um, to the surreality of a lot of it to the grotesquery of a lot of it, there there are aspects of Trump that could only happen at this juncture in time that would have Great. made no sense. Yeah. This is perfect because I've got a few slides that try to <laughs> the re, the try to where I try to redefine what modernism is beyond its stylistic elements. And I thought modernism must be a project um, that is about more than how things look. So this says. Modernism isn't a style. Modernism is a dream of free education and racial equality and libraries full of books and dreams no longer full of tears. And then it says, modernism isn't a style. Modernism is a dream of fair taxation and gender equality, a rise of beauty and, beauty and kindness, a blind dream of love, a promise of civilization. And finally in the series, Modernism is a psychic love wave, a big gush of sky breath, a shimmer of kindness sung by the ancient earth. It is in the voices of the wind in the trees. It is wild and high in the beauty of the wind turbines that will one day scythe the hair of the troglodyte Trump. That was my attempt to re 
magicalize modernism with a sense of belief in, in, in the project of enlightenment. Okay, fantastic. So I can see we've got more questions coming. What we'll do is we'll move on to the second part and then we'll open up again for questions. So this leads in perfectly to what we were going to talk about, which is why, if at all, is art a good medium for protest? And I was going to start with Robert with this one, but I think actually I'll go straight to Sasha, if I may. Sure. Um, so I think, I think what's interesting is it's, it's axiomatic for us now that art should be political. Um, and as Robert says, it seems insane to, to not be engaging with political questions, not to be engaging with ecological questions as an artist. So the first thing that's interesting is how radically that's changed. So if you look at the 18th or 19th century, for a lot of them it's axiomatic that art shouldn't be political. Okay? So, um, and you see this right across the spectrum. So it's not just conservatives. I mean, someone like Wilde, when he talks about... Um, uh, you know, there's no such thing as a moral or an immoral book in the start of Dorian Gray. Part of what he's doing is trying to set out a distinctive sphere for the artistic. And there's another nice example, Kant, uh, Immanuel Kant, the great, we just talked about the Enlightenment, great Enlightenment philosopher, begins to define the artistic by talking about this palace. He says, you see this immense palace, kind of bejeweled and golden, and you're expecting a political point. You know, who, who's who got this palace, where have they got all the cash from, who's paying for all this stuff? And he says, none of that matters if it's art. Okay, Art is about something else. What's interesting is that part of the reason he thought art wasn't political is the same reason we now think it is, which is that he thought of art as that which you can't pin down, that which you can't uh, rigorously conceptualize, that which you can't um, put in a box and have a clear argument about. And so for that reason, the Enlightenment thought it was different from the political, because they thought of the political as a space of uh, fairly clear argument, consensus ultimately. And so they separated off from art, whereas now we like the fact that art is a disorientating, unpinadownable thing. And that's why we find it politically powerful, because we have this conception of the political as a kind of wall that's very hard to penetrate. You know, whatever we seem to do, it seems to just keep on rolling and rolling and possibly getting worse and worse. And you try and explain it to people, it doesn't make any difference. They just still do all the stuff that you think is crazy. And if you have that conception of the political, then the idea of a kind of crack in the wall, a crack in the system, something disorientating and destabilizing that could open things up, a revelation, becomes very, very attractive. So it's interesting that the reason why the Enlightenment thought that art shouldn't be political, at least in some cases, and the reason why we think it should be political is because we have the same view of art. It's not because we've changed our view of art. It's because we've changed our view of politics. Fascinating. Stephanie, do you want to come in on this? Um, sure. I mean, I was going to tackle it from a different perspective, but I guess, I mean, it, I think just to follow on on that, I guess it has to do with the one word that you didn't say, which has to do with the kind of relationship between art and autonomy, which is kind of thinking about yeah. this, you know, from a Kantian perspective of this idea that art is supposed to be disinterested in a, in a certain kind of way, and therefore it has no, it's a question of value. And I feel like those, those ideas have been challenged throughout the history of modernism, and now it's come to a point of kind of the realization or this desire, as you know, as been as being said, of like you can't hold up this idea of autonomy because it's so everything is such a mess in a certain kind of way that, that everything is um, there's no separation between art and the market as we the way that we think about it. I think it's still for me it still goes back to that. I guess you know in terms of thinking about it from an art historical perspective of thinking about protest. I mean, I guess it's still we. I feel like we're still kind of grappling with what is this thing that we call art and. To me, art is a medium of protest. I guess, in a, in a way, I kind of agree with what Sasha's saying here in terms of its kind of, yeah, and it's a refusal of autonomy in a certain kind of way makes it a, a, a useful medium of protest now if we historicize. So to go back to kind of where I started, I feel like you can only have these kind of conversations if you continue to just, you know, historicize what you mean by the definition of art and whether that, you know, so it, again, whether protest is the right word to be using to talk about this in the first place. Mm. Robert. Um, Sasha, where are you placing the Enlightenment in terms of dates? I mean, I guess I'm thinking kind of 1780s onwards. To 1880s? Well... 1850s? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't have strong views on where exactly it would stop. I mean, yeah. Because I've got a possible theory that the reason um, that view might have been widely held in Western Europe is in those years in Western Europe... Mm -hmm expressing political views as an artist was more likely to get you arrested than it is now. And yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. And I think <laughs> that's partly the problem. Um, this is an interesting example. Well, I guess art. where, though? 
in well, Paris. even in Paris, look, Courbet and the Vendome Column. This is a story I love because um, it's something I didn't learn in art history class, but I learned later reading a political book. <laughs> And it's about when Gustave Kirby was one of the great heroes of French modernism, um, maybe the first great French modernist in a sense as a painter, was put in prison for suggesting the destruction of the Vendome Column um, in an essay. So what happened is that he wrote an essay on the 12th of April 1871 saying the first Vendome Column was a symbol of Napoleon's illegal war wars of empire, very contemporary um, subject, and should be destroyed, and then when the Paris Communards destroyed it in that May, Kirby was arrested and put in prison in Versailles for its destruction, and had to leave France, was never allowed to stay in his, in his home again, because they went back to him asking for the, the debt of the rebuilding of the column to be paid, which he couldn't possibly pay, and he had to leave France, live in Switzerland, and die there in exile. And, you know, things, it wasn't that safe. Yeah, of course, as of an course. artist to to be political during the Enlightenment, I don't think. But I mean, I do think there is a there is a theory difference as well. I mean, clearly, you're absolutely right that artists now have, at least in certain countries, have much more freedom of political expression than they did in in the Enlightenment. But I also think there is a theory difference. You know, that whether you look at Kant, whether you look at um, someone like Nietzsche, all the sort of classic voices of kind of European theory, for better or worse, in that period, although they don't agree on anything else don't share our, what seems so obvious to us now, that art should be integrally a political activity. And I don't think that's just because they were worried about getting banged up if they said the wrong thing, because yeah. they said the wrong thing about all kinds of other stuff. I mean, it's possibly because, as a, as a practice, it hadn't been set free of the church and state enough to become really um, um, part of the sort of civic political debate. It only really began to become that around the time of Kirby and the beginning of French modernism, possibly. But also the the protest was not it was I mean obviously in, in relation to the Vendome column it was obvious it was in relation to in, to the commune in mm. relation to the revolution and the politics that were happening throughout mm. that century, but there's also just you know within Corbet's practice itself the kind of protest that takes place just a kind of aesthetic protest right so I feel like again it's you could have a act, you could have a political act that's not an artistic one that's but your artistic protest actually takes place in paint by painting the world know. being much more real and blindly real than it is in the French Academy is Kirby's or just painting messily things. because that you know or whatever it was like formally yeah. there was a, there was a, a protest in the way in which you know that modernism I, I mean going back to your point about questions of modernism and style I mean modernism was a form of protest in terms of a kind of formal practice and I'm not I feel like I mean this is a larger debate within like the history of art of where you you know, of a kind of critique of formalism as a kind of emptying out of politics in a certain way. But I think we can also think of, you know, Corbet in this moment and Corbet's work in painting as we have to kind of think. Them I mean, I see modernism as unfinished and I see the Enlightenment as unfinished projects, both, just to um, make that clear. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think that, you know, the deep question with Enlightenment is always, um, was it was it basically right, but it just didn't get properly applied or it didn't get finished? Or was there some structural problem with it? I mean, you know, the Enlightenment is um, the Enlightenment is, is the period of the Declaration of the, the Rights of Man. It's also the period of mass slavery on an epic scale. So, I mean, and both of those things are closely connected with its structure. So I think we need to be careful with our attitude to the Enlightenment. I mean, it's, it's a complicated a structure. Word, um, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I think this would be a lovely place to bring in the audience in case there are questions. I know there's one towards the back over there. I'll take in a few. Um, so it'd be great if we could have some questions on these themes. Yeah, sorry. I just, oh, well, that's loud. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Robert. I just wanted to ask about the um, modernism uh, poem. Uh, I, hope, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but it just seems to me that it and we were talking earlier about protest art as something that sort of makes direct statements and refuses communication. But I mean, I, I'm sure we all love modernism in this room, but I think there's something inherently dangerous about referring to modernism, you know, as this sort of singular thing that is dreaming about this lovely sort of utopian future, as much as I'd love to believe it. I mean, yeah. you're a poet. The two great modernist poets in the English language, Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot, yeah. were borderline fascists and anti-Semites. I mean, and, and, I, and I do appreciate the vision, and I, and, I'd and I love the vision, but I suppose what I, want to ask, what I wanted to ask the whole panel anyway, and I think this poem to I me sort of brings it up quite nicely is 
surely there is some sort of danger when we have these sort of simplified statements like this that we are going to paper over certain areas of history and in modernism quite significant areas of history okay great and then the person behind you there will take that one at the same time thank you hello hello oh, yeah um i i was 20 minutes late so but, but when i came in i just heard uh, you make a claim that you know if you look at the 20th century literature there is a valorization of a refusal of dialogue but correct me if i'm wrong but like you know i have i have been recently introduced to the works of you know george Badile, mikhail bakhtin and the the theorists who are you know proclaiming that thought is inherently dialogic you know the the very thinking the way we think is is in itself a dialogic is, is in itself dialogic and they they also came up with this he bakhtin especially also came up with this argument of a work of art being a, a synthesis of a, of polyphonous of, of of multiple voices like it's it's inherently polyphonous you know there's there is no author to a work of art like there's no author to a novel you know it's just a collection of bunch of voices that the author is able to see okay fantastic like, what Thank are your you. thoughts on that and we've got a question at the front here yellow jumper could you pass the microphone forward that's great um i had a question concerning so what you said about politics uh when art has to be po political now, we, we expect it to be political. Um, I was thinking about how, about the Foucauldian discourse and how I feel that the kind of norms of the traditional discourse is, um, are fading away and leaving places, uh, for other discourses to form and become established. And I feel like art has always been against the established discord. It's, I mean, that's what I think. Uh, but now I feel like it's becoming an ally to a new established discourse. And does that not kill its capacity, I mean, to be uh, used for a certain protest? If you okay. see what I mean. Wonderful, thanks. Would, would you mind just giving an example, just sorry, just know, so we know what kind of thing you mean? What what new established discourse do you have in mind? Um, I'm, th I'm thinking about, I mean, not only the, I'm thinking about bullshit, for example, as being a new kind of established uh, discourse. So I was thinking if that was relatable to art. I'm taking a chance here of no. That's good. Great. Okay, fantastic. So Sasha really started a dialogue by talking about the refusal of dialogue. So we've got the question about how we define modernism and discomfort about a certain kind of definition of that, the refusal of dialogue, and then the question about established discourses and whether they affect the ability of art to take on a kind of protest form. So who wants to come in? I mean, I can come in on the first point because it was the first question. Um, I mean, yeah, plainly, I'm proposing a slightly absurd idea here, right? It's slightly absurd that modernism would contain all of this hippie stuff and joy and peace and ecstatic sort of, you know, um, an explosion of a psychic love wave of peace exploding across the country and stuff like that. Um, I'm doing that intentionally because I want to examine those ideas and to see if, um, you know, we could relocate the idealism within the modernist project, for example, um, you know, the, and, and, and there is, there's lots of idealism within, within modernism and it's a very big blanket word to say there's, you know, of course, you know, some of the modernist poets have been revealed to be anti-Semites. Yes, but within, but within modernism, there's a lot of great idealism that, you know, is very, very relevant today. Um, the font I use, Futura, was Founded by the the Nova Frankfurt project, which was a sort of lesser known Bauhaus, where they brought great artists and architects together to create ideal and their view social housing and put all their efforts into that. So there's a kind of um, my my question really in in writing these panels was about trying to see if the sort of civic values of free education and and equality of opportunity and racial equality and, and equality of all kinds were were things that were really inherent in maybe the civic life of modernist Britain that we were losing sight of perhaps in the sort of um, post-Thatcherite era, right? And that's sort of what I'm 
examining and then sometimes I'm whining about Brexit. <laughs> this is the panel that says modernism is an architecture, modernism is an anti-architecture. It is the removal of walls and borders and one day we will not get so quickly bored of magic. Spanish guitar music on the banks of the Thames and our children free to wander each other's cities and make new universities in the streets is like an emotional response to what I feel was like this beautiful time that my generation had to go and study in Madrid and Paris and Warsaw and have Polish students and Spanish students come here and that beauty of feeling like the generation who had, um, you know, was part of a European family. It makes me terribly sad that that might disappear. And, you know, I think we have to discuss that. That's great. And I, I want to come to Stephanie on the modernism question as lecturer on American modernism. <laughs> I think you've got something to add here. I mean, yeah, I guess I don't have particularly any, I mean, I don't have a particular response to that. I guess I just, yeah, I mean, I think of modernism as something, or maybe I just think about it slightly differently. I'm interested in kind of, well, photographic modernisms and kind of doc in, in, in documentaries relation to modernism. But the work of the work of artists that I find to be provocative in terms of kind of protest, like a classic example of an artist that I've been working on recently is someone um, named Martha Rossler, who might be very familiar as well to those who might who are interested in kind of 70s practice, who makes work that actually, you know, is in protest, posters that are in relation to protest, is someone who I think, although she's and this is a kind of roundabout answer, is working in relation to the 1970s is still working in the traditions of modernism. And I feel like maybe in relation to what Robert's talking about is that it's not something that has necessarily, we have this idea that things move on and they go away and they've become eclipsed by something like postmodernism. And if we, or, you know, even I think a word that hasn't been brought up is kind of in relation to kind of neoliberalism and these, these ways in which we think about this. But actually the kind of relation, the kind of questions that were taken up by modernism in this kind of early moment of thinking about publics in relation to kind of the circulation of the image, I think is something that we still, we've kind of, I don't know, moved on from, but I think it's still kind of important to think about in those kind of practices. I'm not sure if I've really... Right, and Martha, Martha Ross's series, Bringing the War Home, for yeah. example, could be seen as a kind of collage art that actually kind of opens dialogue, Sasha. <laughs> well, that, that brings... <laughs> but it's the, but and the, also then influences Jenny Holtzer, who's... The, 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 the point of... The, interest, the reason of, why those works, I think, are so interesting, because when she... Or in relation to what we've been talking about, because when she made them... You in, might describe those works for... Sure. Yeah. So she made a series of posters between 67 and 1972, in which she... Bringing the war back home, I guess, right? Well, it's called yeah. uh, House Beautiful, Bringing the War Home, um, although sometimes it gets reversed. Um, but she made them by cutting out... Um, images from Life magazine of protest or protesters and um, kind of the atrocities of the Vietnam War that were circulating in life, um, and then pasting them into pages of House Beautiful. That's kind of the general gist. It's not always like that, but that's... And then she she Xeroxed, she photographed them and Xeroxed them and passed them out at war at protests, and they were never thought about as works of art. They were, they were flyers for protest. Um, and it wasn't until... 1991 that actually they got um, made into what we now understand as art because they were brought into the gallery setting and shown as works of art. And that in itself was a form of protest because it was specifically she she decided to, to, to she decided to take work that was categorically not art that she def did never defined as as art in the kind of way in which it would be bought and sold and framed and put in a gallery as a work of art. She decided to do that at the very moment in which um, the Iraq War started. So it was a way in which, again, this is what I think is really interesting about a kind of modernist intervention is this kind of these relations to repetition and this kind of need to bring this back. And then she remade them in 2004 um, in relation to the decision to go to war, and she's continued to remake them. And now they're considered artistic works, but their original, or if, or if we want to the way in which they were made was as a, a kind of protest flyer. And so I think it's a kind of interesting example of a work of visual culture that, you know, moves in this kind of spectrum between something that's a protest that's actually um, a kind of piece of ephemera of protest that then becomes an artistic practice because it becomes codified as a work of art that's sold in a gallery and then now is, cons you know, but retrospectively artists have called those ones in the 60s art even though they were never really thought of in that kind of way. Mm. Sasha. 
Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, I, I mean, I think that this issue of repetition of modernism is fascinating. I mean, um, I suppose uh, to say something about this this question of dialogue that I introduced. Um, I mean, I think not all talking is dialogue, right? I mean, so if I have a conversation with someone who thinks exactly the same as me, we have a superficial dialogue, okay? But in a sense, we don't have that range of voices, that polyphony of voices. And I think this is sometimes the problem with protest art, and I think you see it in this example. You know, these are, are protest things made to be handed out at a protest to people who are already protesting the Vietnam War for the reasons that you're showing in the images. And I mean, I think they're an interesting work of art, and I definitely don't want to attack them on that basis. But I think that's also the sense in which they are protest art. I mean, if you imagine, think of the spectrum of people who had different opinions of Vietnam. Think of someone who came from a military family who saw it in those terms. Think of someone who had lost someone in that conflict who saw it in those terms. How, how could these flyers speak to those people? And of course, the tragedy is that most of the time they don't. So that's what I mean by the refusal of dialogue. It's not the absence of speech. It's the absence of speech with anyone who holds a distinct position from you. Um, so do you mean something like the refusal to engage with people who disagree with you. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it is that, but, um, and it is tied up with the spectacle. I mean, so when you have a, a, you know, a, a, a sudden flash of a, a sentence, what you're getting there is, is not the kind of process, for better or for worse, I'm not posing this as a criticism, but as a kind of analysis, you're not getting the kind of process where you would see what moves that person and try to speak to his or her position and try to bring them around. Say, so, you know, look, this person seems, you know, the guy down the road, he seems a decent guy. I've known him all my life. He thinks that we shouldn't pull out of Vietnam. Okay, so I've got two choices. I decide that this guy down the road is a monstrous fascist. He's been a monster all the time and I just never noticed it. That's one choice. Or I try and work out what's going on with him. Why does he see things like this? And I think protest art is very bad at taking that second option. And I think it's, it's very good at taking the first option. I think it also has to do with this kind of, when you think about something in relation to dialogue, you think about individuals speaking to each other. And I don't think all protest art... I think we have to think about the difference between a work of art that speaks to a kind of larger question of a public and a civic. Yeah, no, totally. As opposed to, I want to have a conversation with you about Brexit or yeah. I want, you know, and I think what some of the most, I mean, I hate to use that word, but kind of successful protest art in that way actually gets, maybe this is, you know, part of what you're, what you're suggesting is it goes beyond that need to have a dialogue on a one-on-one -on -one kind of relationship because it's not really about the, whether, we agree on this or not. And what I think is kind of interesting and maybe goes to the question of the institutional question is, you know, that lots of protest art or ac activist work that um, sees itself as being political activist is actually speaking to the group of people that already agree with yeah. what's yeah. happening. And so, yeah. or, you know, and does it feel, fall deaf on those, you know, yeah. group of people? I mean, I think also, you know, sometimes the dialogue framework isn't isn't a helpful one and that's why i don't want to call all politically active production by artists protest art i mean i use the case of assemble who won won the turner prize in what 2015 mm. um for what's basically a form of social activism you know it's reconstructing a street of houses for the benefit of the occupants who live there it's creating some form of community through practical charitable architecture in a way now I don't think that the notion of dialogue is particularly helpful there. I think other notions, you know, notions of dwelling, notions of community um, are more helpful. But that's why I don't think, that doesn't seem to yeah, be I protest mean, a, I mean, there's a larger debate, especially within art historical discourse around kind of um, socially engaged, this term socially engaged art and whether socially yeah. engaged art should be dialogical and communal and humanitarian and we should get together and all kind of agree on yeah. what something is or whether it should be incredibly antagonistic and... Um, you know, point to the realities of the antagonism within yeah. the social system. So I think that maybe that's another way to kind of bring yeah. this dialogue question out. I, I think I think art's also a, a place for the sort of um, the emotional response to political things. So that isn't necessarily part of a dialogue or part of an argument. Sometimes it's just a place to have a more sort of a heartbroken response to political reality, a more heartbroken response to the war, a more heartbroken response to things that are happening in the world. So it's a place that we can find an emotional language within relatively public space to 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 look at things in a slightly more emotionally engaged way, I think. And sometimes art's just that. Sorry, just going to reply to the gentleman at the back um, regarding uh, dialogue in, in 20th century literature. Yeah, you have to forgive me. Sorry, it was... It was um, I was unclear. I mean, I, d I definitely don't want to say that there aren't 
profound dialogic strands within within you know of course 20th century literature is a very 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 big thing um i mean i guess i meant more that the idea that silence might be the right response the idea that a refusal to speak would be the heroic or would be the exemplary thing i think that is an interesting strand of 20th century literature and i think you see it in for example um a melville's uh, bartleby essay which has become this kind of obsession for 20th century philosophy you know you're you're, you're not anyone unless you've written another interpretation of what's going on with bartleby <laughs> and bartleby is about this very strange character for those of you who don't know the story who um stops carrying out his duties so he's employed in this this office and he just stops doing what he's meant to and his kind of co-workers and his manager come to him and say you know why you know why won't you do this and he just says i would prefer not to he doesn't give any explanation. And they, they try and cajole him and reason. They're like, but it's in your interest. Or like, just do a bit. Or do it or we'll fire you. Do it or we'll call the police. He never says anything except this one sentence. He doesn't engage. Now, that has become, for better or for worse, this kind of totemic example of the ethical response in 20th century philosophy. And there are other strands in 20th century theology, for example, the, the dominance of negative theology, the idea that we can't speak about God, so there has to be a kind of silence or at best a kind of gibberish. So I think there are these are these strands in the 20th century of the denial of speech as a heroic act or the refusal of speech as a heroic act? I'm not saying they're the only strands, of course, that would be, that would be crazy, but I think they are present. Thank you, fantastic. So we're going to go into the third part of our discussion now, and again, leads on quite nicely from that. So here we're going to be thinking about whether it's possible to balance the objectives of making art and making a political statement so you know which should take priority for instance i'm thinking here you know one of the archetypal current examples of protest artists are um pussy riot and they explicitly say that you know their pieces are often chaotic and not particularly good art and they prioritize the making of a political statement so robert may i start with you here potentially conflicting objectives <laughs> Um, what was the question again? <laughs> is it possible to balance the potentially conflicting objectives of making art and making a political statement? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if when you make art with political content, you necessarily are doing something that would be better done as a political statement in, a, in the wrong medium. Mm -hmm. I think what happens as an artist is that certain things sort of haunt you and and niggle at you and you can't avoid making work about them. I think it's the things that get under your skin that eventually lead to you engaging with and those could be non political things actually and you know, but it's just that I mean I th think that if you're if your sort of mind is open and your sort of heart is open, you end up being affected by sort of the political crisis sees of your day and those sort of seep into your work. I don't necessarily think that artists say, okay, I'm going to make some political art today. I think they just make their art and, and politics seeps into it as much or as little as it does, really. And you, you were talking about our particular context, ecological crisis and so on. Do you ever think of yourself as under some sort of duty to engage politically as an artist? I mean, I think, yes, I feel a slight moral duty to engage. And I do feel that for some reason, I think if you don't, it's sort of, a I think the silence in that case would be a sort of admittance that you're happy for ecological disaster to wipe away our civilization. I also think that artists don't have the best answer to that. I think Extinction Rebellion, which has been blocking the streets of London for the last four weekends, Extinction Rebellion, the, act, the new activist group have the best answer, actually, which is stopping traffic on all the bridges every weekend. And I think that they're the one set of people I see doing something um, befitting the, the the seriousness of the situation. So, so in, in that case, they're doing a better job than than me and any artists that I can see right now. Stephanie, um, yeah, I mean, again, it just it, for me, it keeps kind of turning around this question of, you know, how we're defining art in, mm. in that kind of way. Um, and yeah, I would agree in the sense that I don't think it's like, 
I mean, with many of the artists that I'm that I work on or write about or think about, I think their engagements are incredibly political. That they're like Martha Rossa, for example, or the other example of um, how I started thinking about protest art is the work of Alan Sekula, who's a, a very well known photographer who made a very important piece in 2000 around the um, protests in Seattle in relation to the alter globalization movement. And I think what's really interesting about some of those works of kind of getting out into the street and photographing a protest is that that in itself, of course, does not make it protest art. And so it's not, I think sometimes we confuse like the content of what the work is with its definition of what protest is, where actually for me, what's political or kind of pro would be a, a kind of definition of protest and that kind of work is is its relation to the kind of history of photography and the history of art and the history of journalism. And so for me, those kind of, a, a good work of protest art or a kind of political work of art is, again, engaging with those kind of long histories and is having a, if we're going to have a dialogue, it's not necessarily a dialogue with the audience, but it's a dialogue with other artistic practices and kind of understanding your place within that history and trying to kind of, um, recognize your relationship to a public in terms of those kinds of histories. Because I think one of the other really interesting thing that's come up recently in relation to people beginning to try to think about how we historicize some of these questions is that lots of these, lots of what we understand to be protest art or what we understand as maybe art and activism or is that a lot of it is just very much hidden from the history. It hasn't been historicized. It hasn't been it hasn't been written about or it hasn't been shown or it, or it doesn't fit into the way what the kinds of work that you might show in a museum context and of course mm -hmm. there's some really interesting curatorial inventions interventions that have tried to kind of push those kinds of questions but i think it is about you know it's not just about the work but kind of what what the work does to bring these other histories to light in a certain kind of way it's one way to kind of think about it sasha yeah i mean it's it's a i mean, tell you, I mean that was so I was just thinking about that's really interesting both you. I mean, I think the first thing we have to be honest about is that the most politically effective images in the current period are not protest art. They are either piece of photojournalism, I think of the body of Alan Curdy on the beach, or they are um, videos produced by non-state actors such as ISIS or other groups glamorizing what they're doing. I and mean, these are the political images that are having effects. These are the political images that are having implications far beyond um, you know, kind of museum, museum supported or not museum supported um, pieces of protest art within the West. I think the other thing we have to be careful of, well, I mean, the, the next thing is there's, of course, this, as, as Stephanie very eloquently points out, this huge underlying problem that if we're going to think about what the tension between protest art and art is, we need to know what art is doing. And of course, that is the issue where we have no um, clear understanding at present. We have no idea what, what the function of this activity is, what precisely is it meant to be doing. I mean, if you thought that art was about creating beautiful things, for example, then you've got a, a clear position on this. You can see there's going to be a tension between politics and beauty, but of course no one does now think it's about creating beautiful things, so it's hard, hard to frame the issue. Um, yeah. Maybe you do, maybe you do. <laughs> I mean, I, I like to think that art is about making beautiful things that can also engage with political questions, yes. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not at all phobic of the idea of art being about beautiful things making beautiful things. Yeah, well, I mean, that's cool then. And then you see that, then you've got uh, enough of a framework to see if there might be tensions. Um, I mean, I think the other thing we do have to be conscious of, and maybe this relates to the, uh, the question um, from the lady in yellow regarding new orthodoxies, that protest art is, there is a kind of political danger to it, which is it preaches to the converted in a way that alienates the non-converted. So, for example, there's this ridiculous um, movement that the government tried to put together called Artists for Brexit. Um, and it's ridiculous because there aren't any. Okay? I mean, so they've got kind of, they've got sort of two of them and they trot them out every time. Um, but the fact that there aren't any is kind of interesting. Now, the danger is that whatever your position on Brexit, what's then going to happen is you're going to get a political art culture that's preaching to and for people who already share the positions of the artists making it. And the difficulty is then people who don't already share those convictions aren't going to be convinced or moved by it because of this non-dialogue aspect I spoke of before. What they're going to see is this slightly strange thing that starts from a position they don't share and seems to treat them with great condescension. You know, that you, you don't want the beautiful wave or you're rejecting, rejecting love or something like that. And of course, the people who support a Brexit don't think of themselves as rejecting love or rejecting the beautiful wave. And so there's a danger of creating a, a political medium that 
speaks to people who share the basic assumptions again and again and again in a way that radically alienates people who don't share the basic assumptions. Now, that's not always going to be a problem, and they're, they're very interesting uses of it. I mean, I loved Robert's description of the idea of public points of heartbreak or something like that. But it is important to think how that's functioning in the political ecosystem. If you inject into this ecosystem a movement, a mechanism that precisely works by radicalizing the assumptions of the in-group in a way that condescends to the assumptions of the out-group, that's going to not necessarily be a mechanism that you want to dominate the political conversation. I mean, I think that's a really valid point. I, th I think, I think, preaching to the converted and condescending to to opposite points of view is like a is probably like a, a terrible sort of trap, actually. And and it's a really good point to keep in in mind. Um, yeah, when one makes art about politics, I think it's a really valid concern. So that introduces an, an interesting question that we haven't really been engaging with because we've sort of been thinking a little bit about whether protest art can be good art. But there's this other question, which is whether protest art is good politics. Um, so if, if you're somebody who thinks that um, there are these kind of separate domains or at least that politics has its own internal dynamics and art has its own internal dynamics. Maybe there can be a problem here with trying to blur the distinction between the two. Sorry, I mean, just one, and one nice thing, one thing I like very much about, um, about Robert's work is that there, there, there's, of course, ways to mediate across this kind of gap. And, you know, something that I think he does, he does very beautifully is, is seizing upon notions of the personal, notions of, um, for example, personal loss or personal experience or personal expectation or disorientation or hope, you know, a feeling of hope that everyone, whatever their political orientation has had at, at points in their life, and then um, communicating through that. So I think that kind of thing is effective because it starts by, by reaching out to the other person. It starts from a point where there's some kind of shared access. Thanks. Yeah, and it starts by, by being hurt or being emotionally affected by something. Yeah, I, think, yeah. I think that's as soon as you... If you're hurt, you're vulnerable, you're kind of open to, um, it's, 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 it's an opening state of being, I think. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that's a really nice way of putting it. You know, the, 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 the difficulty is to move beyond kind of just blank walls shouting at each other. But as you say, if you've got this kind of opening in the position through a state of vulnerability, there's a way in which you can, you can talk to someone as another individual and then, you know, go on from there. Okay, fantastic. So we've got 15 minutes left, and I'd love to bring you back in to the conversation. So if anybody has any questions, do raise your hand. Okay, fantastic. We've got one at the back there. Could you wait for the mic to reach you? And we'll take a group again and then answer them. Yes, my issue is the fact that the, some, something brought up earlier regarding the question of status quo art and postmodernism. In your experience at the panel, the question of gentrification and bourgeois art, do you believe that any radical protest in the new, new millennium can be enlightening or conforming? Considering the challenge of dialogue, you mentioned universities in the street. In my experience, modern art or oh, postmodern art is rather tame by comparison in terms of compared to, say, the post-1968 dialogue, open protest, and disorder. What's your take on that? Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Was there one? Yeah, just a sec. It's coming round. I, I just, uh, I'm thinking about the common, the common format of uh, uh, Caps Lock and the Tangerine Tweeter and, and your <laughs> Caps Lock uh, Robert, and I was just wondering if you might like to reconsider. <laughs> <laughs> For the benefit of people not on Twitter, could you could you just explain exactly what you mean? <laughs> Sasha's not on Twitter, for example. <laughs> my, my cryptic description of uh, a certain world leader. Um, you mean Trump? Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 Tweeting in all caps. Yeah. And okay. Twitter was uh, <laughs> sad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Has, has a habit of getting his caps lock key on early in the morning and uh, giving us the benefits of his uh, his wisdom, yeah. uh, including the fact that English people apparently are chanting, we want Trump. Right. Uh, French people are speaking in English out of consideration <laughs> for him, I think. 
Um, yeah, great. Thanks. Anyway, I just wondered about the. I, I love Futura, by the way, but uh, yeah. <laughs> not so sure about having everything in capital letters. It sounds a bit shouty, and that's in marked contrast to the. Yeah. Okay, slight, that's slightly kind of whimsical um, semantics in some sense. Mm. Thank you very much. That's great. And then, could you put your hand up at the back? So the, there we go. I guess my question is that kind of now in the era of like neoliberalism, right? The people that we really should be protesting against are like big co uh, corporations who are contributing to kind of ecological crisis, contributing to inequality, but they have power over all of the public spaces. Most mm. people who study art work for big corporations. Mm. Um, how is it kind of possible to protest corporations when they take up all of the artists, but also take up all of the space? Well, you can steal their billboards. For a start. <laughs> yeah. Okay, brilliant. So I'll put those questions back to the panel. Do you want to come in? Um, on which ones? On any that you like. Uh, I think I think I started making work on billboards for that reason. I just decided I would just change the billboards to my text works instead of a Diet Coke ad because it sort of you know, I'm motivated by that feeling. And um, you hardly ever get arrested. You hardly ever get in, in any trouble. You can open the ads at the end of bus stops with an Allen key you can buy from Halfords because it's just a hexagonal Allen key. It's not even a proper lock. And do that yourself. And I started doing that in 2004. And that was my, my, my work for five years. It was almost all the legal billboards. And... Um, I only got arrested once in five years, so it's pretty safe to go out and steal the billboards and put up whatever you want. Can I just come in here because you said, um, I read that when you were picked up by the police, yeah. you then had a discussion with one of the police officers um, about poetry and managed to convince him to let you go. <laughs> so this I, is another good point I did, about I had, dialogue, I, I, actually. I, I, I had a dialogue with one of them. <laughs> Um, and I had a book of poetry in my pocket, and I started talking about it was a, it was a, a piece I didn't, yeah, in East London. And you know, I, he he actually saw the point of having sort of whimsical poetry in place of an ad on the Bethnal Green Road, and let me off quite lightly. So you know, it's not people aren't as monstrous as as you think. I always think um, on the question of globalization and that and and, and neoliberalism and the sort of kind of art that's being made. That which was your first question, I think. Um, and I, I think there's two strains of, of the avant-garde that post 20th century that have one of which has evolved very quickly. And that's the sort of post de Champion strand, right? And in the post de Champion strand, art was jokes about art. It was ironic. It was humorous. It was pithy. And it led to sort of great work by people like Damien Hirst and some YBAs. And you could see that work having its absolute pinnacle with the work of Jeff Koons. And I think Jeff Koons is probably the end of the post champion tradition in a sense. And I think the slower second strand of the avant-garde is the Boisean tradition. And that's a tradition that hasn't, that I, th I think is going to become the interesting strand of the avant-garde for the next few decades. And there we're seeing a Boisean conception of avant-garde art, art practice. And that is a kind of practice where holistically art making, politics, society, and crucially, the question of spirituality are one holistic thing. Duchampianism, I think, occludes spirituality, uh, makes jokes about spirituality, and Boisianism really makes an earnest search to sort of re-engage with the spirituality that we could inhabit some sense of um, a shared human soul via, you know. And I think that from that point of view, the Duchampian strand has been given a lot of props by institutions and museums, and the Boisean strand is just beginning to sort of fight back. And has Trump ruined text art in uppercase letters? <laughs> I heard that Trump misspelled sm smoking gun this morning to smoking gun. He said they hadn't found any smoking gun, any um, M S M O C K I N G gun um, in the Russian investigation. Um, 
but they, so they haven't found a smoking gun. Does that mean they have found a smoking gun? <laughs> I don't know. Um, he can't spell either. So, yeah. Uh, Stephanie, how about this question about neoliberalism and the spaces all being owned by corporations? I mean, you. You also work on the Cuban context, which is completely different. So protest art in that context doesn't have to deal with the same sorts of issues. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it deals with a whole different set of issues. But it, I mean, it is a shared conversation in terms of a kind of question of decolonization of imperialism. So the, mm. the conversation is, I mean, I think that's one of the interesting things about the Cuban context is that it is, it is on the one hand seemingly we had imagined so far removed, but actually always part of a Western, con I mean, it's still part of a Western conversation in a Western context. But one of the joint, one of the ways in which the practices, and obviously this is a huge generalization, but one way in which we could think these, the relationship between kind of debates around neoliberalism and the kind of corporate sponsorship of museums in relation to some of the other, other uh, protests that could be taking place in Cuba right now, which is, as we were just um, talking about, which some of you have probably read in the news in relation to the current um, artist whose work is in the Turbine Hall, Tanya Bergara, who's currently in Cuba protesting a declaration that um, would essentially censor artistic practice or basically insist that the government would have to, you'd have to have a license in order to make art, which would essentially censor what you could make. One of the larger questions that connects both of these is questions about privacy and privatization. And so mm -hmm. what, you know, and this larger question of kind of the freedom of expression, right? And so there's, I mean, this is some, obviously this is not five minutes to go is not the place to open this up. But I mean, I think one of the huge debates around kind of how we think about protest and protest art is, is these kinds of debates about free speech, um, which we haven't really spoken about. But I guess to get back to the question of, you know, I mean, I think this is what movements like Occupy and a whole relation, a whole kind of, um, I mean, a handful of different kind of artistic collectives, whether they, I don't even think that they would call themselves that, whether it's artists coming together. Um, but most of them, most of what we understand today or is written about in relation to kind of social engagement or activism are in relation to protesting within museums. They're still protesting within museum spaces. And I think that is important to recognize that it's not just about stepping outside and saying, well, that that's co-opted, so therefore I have to protest someplace else. I mean, I think even Occupy, I mean, by choosing Wall Street, it's, it's thinking in relation to those kinds of things. So the occupation of space, I think, still has to, you have to understand the, the need to work within the institution and outside it, but you can't just kind of remove yourself from the institutional practice. So like even today, I mean, I was just reading on my phone on the way over here, the kind of decolonized the museum has set up a protest in the Whitney asking for the um, removal of one of the board members who was basically responsible for producing the tear gas that Trump, that basically was tear gassing migrants on the American border. And so these things are not, whether that's protest art is a whole, you know, to go back to where we started, is that protest art? But I think you can't, you know, all of these things are, all of these questions are so interconnected that I think kind of removing yourself from a site of corporation or corporate sponsorship is impossible in a certain kind of way. And so I think you have to constantly be working inside and outside at the same time. Okay, fantastic. So I think we had one question over here. Yeah, did you want to ask a question? What can protest art actually do? What limitations are there of protest art? And what of art is sacrificed in the protest? Okay, fantastic way to end. So may I go to you, Sasha? Sure. I mean, I think it's, it's complex. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the spectacles of the last, the last few years of the, the Trump administration has been the, the incredible impotence of protest art in the States. Um, to achieve any kind of significant um, effect. I think in some cases you have governments that are foolish enough to make protest art very effective. I mean, any government that's stupid enough to tell artists they must have a license to produce art is going to guarantee a certain kind of conflict that the artist will ultimately win. And they may, they may kill them, they may torture them, but the artist will always ultimately win that. Whereas a government that's sensible corrupt, evil enough, whatever, to simply swamp the discourse with all kinds of bullshit is going to be much more effective at maintaining control in the current situation. Um, the dangers of it, I think the dangers of it, 
that it goes, this goes back to why why I think whether Trump is a pre or postmodern thing because so I was talking to a Republican uh, operative a while ago and he said to me that the thing that he hadn't realized about Trump was that he had spent ages looking for a candidate who was the kind of true con who had all the the aspects of policy that he thought the base wanted so you know they had to have these very very specific very extreme policy positions um, and he spent ages looking for this person and then Trump doesn't have most of them and this guy said and what I realized with Trump was that the base didn't really care about all these things I thought they cared about all the Reaganite agenda everything what they really cared about was sticking it to cultural elites on the coast and that the person who was going to do it most viscerally most obviously most often was going to be like perfect one and that's why I think Trump's postmodern because it's the reason one significant reason why he has this enormous pull is because it's after modernism and because he's counting on he's banking on the kind of an almost allergic reaction that a part of the population has to not just modernism as an idea but to the articulation of it for example through certain art forms um, so in that sense I think he couldn't have happened a hundred years ago because you need that counter reaction that he's feeding off thanks Esha so we've got two minutes left a minute for Stephanie and a minute for Robert um I mean, I think we have to just ask ourselves what we expect of the artistic practice. I mean, what we see as a successful protest. I mean, I don't think necessarily the work that many of these artists are doing is to actually, it's not policy, it's not to change policy. It's its to intervene in a sort of kind of social situation and raise awareness for, you know, the atrocities that are going on. And I think one, just to add for my last 30 seconds, I think one of the interesting things in the, in the, in, that Trump has done successfully is that he's really muddied the definition of what a protester is. And we, you know, I mean, the classic example is the Charlottesville protest in which, you know, protest the alt-right is a, you know, a very important form of protest. And I think we spend, we sometimes spend all of our time talking about protest art as if it's just a kind of left phenomenon and it's clearly not. And I feel like, you know, that's something important to kind of think about in terms of kind of how protester, how pro, just as represented and who counts as a protester and what that means in relation to artistic practice. I mean, I think um, the example of Extinction Rebellion that I mentioned earlier, which is a relatively new group in London who've been blocking the bridges across the river for the last sort of five or six weekends, um, is front of my mind on this question because I think that they're the most interesting um, form of protest art or protest intervention happening in our city at the minute. I think it's a really interesting way of explaining a problem. They block traffic on the bridges for seven minutes, I think. They explain to drivers the reason is that fossil fuels are killing the planet rapidly and will cause massive sort of civilization collapse if we don't fix our reliance on them. And, um, you know, I so, I mean, this month, I'm thinking about them as the most effective artists and myself is not very effective. All right, well, fascinating discussion. Uh, so this is our last forum event of the term, but do come back next term for another wonderful schedule of events. Please join me in thanking our panel for a really thought-provoking talk and thanks to all of you for coming. Thank you.